Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Billy Keels, the host of the Going Long Podcast. Freedom. Every week I'm going to be here interviewing the absolute best in the business as it relates to real asset investing, as well as real Main Street investors. We're going to be having conversations where you can listen in and that's going to help you to continue on your path to education so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident in investing long distance. So make sure that you, uh, that you go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Make sure that you're liking it as well because that way you can get every single episode as soon as it comes out. And by the way, don't forget to leave today's episode a five-star review. Let's go ahead and listen to today's conversation. Welcome to the Going Long Podcast. We're back once again to continue to help to educate you so that you feel much more comfortable and confident investing beyond your backyard. I'm your host, Billy Keels. And you know what? If you've ever wanted to know how to dream big and at the same time protect your assets, then guess what? This is the conversation that you're going to want to listen to until the very end, because today's guest is not only a nationally recognized educator in asset protection, he also makes it difficult for predators to uh, to target you and your assets. And he's been selected to the best attorney of America's list of 2020, and he is the senior managing partner at Bradley Legal Corp. Welcome to the show, Brian Bradley. Welcome to the show, Brian. Hey, thanks, Billy, for having me on and, you know, putting this podcast together. And it's a very important topic. You know, like I like investing also. I like cash flow. Um, and at the same time, I like to keep what I got. And uh, I hope that the concepts we talk about today help your listeners out. And we're going to be blowing up, you know, the status quo, cleaning up a lot of misconceptions. And I'm, you know, it's going to be fun, especially with the international aspect of it as well. Yeah, this is really, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to this. It's been a long time in the, uh, in the making. And so, uh, yeah, let's, let's jump right into the goodness, man. So yeah. I guess first and foremost, uh, you know, I'm here in Spain and I always love to be able to connect our guests and would love for you to help us to understand where exactly kind of what city do you live in the United States? Yeah, I live on the you know Pacific Northwest, so the West Coast um, in Oregon, based out of Portland, Oregon. So we're the state above California, below Washington. Uh, law firms based out of there, and then the good thing is with you know like how I practice and with my business is I represent clients nationally um, and throughout the world, and so I'm not you know pigeonholed to just one specific lo- location. All right. We love that. And we're going to dive into some of that today. So uh, the great state of Oregon. And then what's the most positive thing that's happened to you in the last 24 hours, Brian? Well, the last 24 hours, um, you know, I discovered, uh, to- was, it, was it Tony Robbins' um, personal development information? And so I've just been like diving into like, you know, his crazy rhetoric, you know, and really just elevating, you know, you know, myself with, get, you know, constantly building up that ultimate edge, you know, like it never stops, you know, like you always got to grow and grow and grow. And, you know, I I learned about Tony Robbins, you know, about a couple of weeks ago and um, his material. And so I've just been like pumping through that. Right on. Very cool, man. So love that. So Tony Robbins is now introduced into your life. So hold on, hold on, hold on. It's a rocket, rocket, man. Uh, Awesome. (laughs) Uh, so, So listen, so we, so I've highlighted like barely scratched the surface, right? On the things that, that you have done, the things that you are doing to continue to go out and educate and help the marketplace uh, in the area of asset protection. Give us a little bit of your backstory as you'd like to tell it. And maybe if you can tell us about some of the different uh, decisions that you've made along the way to help you get to this point in your journey. Yeah. So, you know, like, as you said, I'm an asset protection attorney and, you know, I got into asset protection on the litigation and trial side. Um, of the law, you know, going into court and representing people. And I just got tired of seeing people's lives just turned upside down and having false sense of securities and expectations. And at the same time, you know, like I like investing, like I said, and building up cash flow and investing in real estate and things like that. And I would really got sick of seeing people thinking they are doing things properly, not doing things properly, and then losing their retirement um, or, you know, whatever, whatever the asset is. And, um, by being good at what I do and being through, you know, going through court, um, I just realized that the legal system here in the U S is just broken and it's not about justice any longer. You know, we're just a Sue happy Nirvana. We have more than 40 million lawsuits filed every year in the U S um, something more like a $400 billion business, more than 99% of all the lawsuits in the world are filed here. Um, And so it's just turned into, like I said, a plaintiff driven, um, legal system where they have no skin in the game. Um, and we don't have a, if you lose, you pay legal system to where if you lose, 
who cares? You didn't lose anything because there's no skin in the game. There's no consequences for filing predatory lawsuits. Mm-hmm. Um, so you don't ever have to think twice about go, you know, filing a lawsuit against somebody. And so what I wanted to do was get ahead of the game and introduce asset protection into my firm and associated with, you know, a couple of the top law firms in the world. And we just happened to really work well together combined with my litigation and trial background. Um, and so when we create systems and structures for investors, I look at it as I don't care what happens when everything's, you know, rosy and the sun's shining. I want to know what happens and is this going to hold up in court when it's being challenged and there's a war chest coming after you. Mm-hmm. And so that's the perception I look at um, asset protection systems. Um, and that's why I use really strong ones. And what I think a person really is after when they call in and say, hey, Brian, I'm looking to protect my assets. What they're really asking for is just, hey, I want peace of mind. And so that's what we're doing is creating peace of mind for investors and knowing that their lifestyle is going to be preserved. You know, like you're working really hard for a reason. You want to protect that. And I get a lot of joy out of being the person to say, hey, just take a deep breath. We can create the systems and the structures in place and create legal barriers um, between your assets and yourself um, by using LLCs and limited partnerships and bridge trusts, asset protection trusts, just like a safe. We put them into the safe and we protect them. The same thing with your assets and your investments. So, so I love that being able to, you know, have that focus not only on being able to help others to protect uh, protect our assets, but also to having that investor focus, which is something that you mentioned that you also like to be able to do. And it's about being able to create the structures and the and the processes in place so that ultimately uh, one of your clients is is safe. You know, I, so so there's a so many different ways we could kind of take this conversation, right? And but look, I'm just going to ask the like the really simple question right from the very yeah. beginning because what is like asset protection but there's this whole concept of a revocable living trust <laughs> right and so having been through this i understand it but help people understand how much actually asset protection comes in a revocable living trust and also help us understand what a irrevo- irre- revocable trust is sorry i got tongue tied a little bit there so. yeah and there's a lot of more trust in that but yeah, yeah. the misconception i get from most clients that come in is i have a revocable living trust which is basically just a will and a fancy will that avoids probate Perfect. which means like, i die and i don't want the court to dictate and tell where my property is going to go and decrease death taxes it offers zero asset protection because they're not designed to. There's no features of that to protect the assets. And they only come into effect when you die. Yep. So what happens when you're living and you get sued? They, they're not there to protect you because they're not designed to. Hmm. And then here in the US, our death taxes um, percentage increase substantially. So unless you have and you're married like over $25 million, you really don't need to avoid death taxes for inheritance issues. Um, really you're just using that for probate to avoid the courts and, you know, and dictating where your assets go to. So a revocable living trust and revocable means it can be revoked. It can be changed, um, from an assets protection standpoint, anything that can be revoked easily is very bad because a court can say, we don't like this. I want you to revoke it or change it, or I will hold you in civil contempt of court. Mm -hmm. And that's bad. Um, so you can have revocable asset protection trust. Asset protection trusts are completely different. They're self-settled spendthrift trusts, fancy word for just saying created by you, for you, as your own beneficiary with fancy um, creditor protections. Um, we can break down asset protection trusts in more detail a little bit later, but that's the difference between a revocable versus irrevocable trust. Irrevocable, it can't be changed very easily. It's very hard. And then okay. depending on how strong they are, depends on the jurisdiction, domestic, offshore, different states have different strengths. That's the basic difference. Revocable living trust, no protection. Irrevocable trust, some asset protection trust, more. Okay. That, and that's awesome. So, because that's one of the things that everybody talks about from the very beginning, right? And so I just wanted to ask that question, but I think yeah. it's really important that we take a couple steps back, right? And and also just in general, what what Brian is going to be talking about with us today and a lot of the, are a lot of the different concepts that you can think about in terms of being able to protect your assets, right? He, we're not here giving advice and things like that. He's sharing his experiences and sharing his knowledge. And so, I think this concept for many, many people is just very foreign, no pun, no pun intended, but 
Help us to understand at the very basics, Brian, what is asset protection and who are the different players that are involved in asset protection? Yeah. So asset protection, it's not traditional estate planning. Like it's modern estate planning. And what we're doing is simply just placing a legal barrier between your assets and a potential creditor, the person suing you before it's needed. You know, courts don't really uphold these type of systems if you're being sued and then you start creating it because that's just called a fraud, fraudulent transfer. Um, but that's it. We're just creating legal barriers. It's just like a barrier, like a safe for your gold or your guns or your watches, you know, all your valuables. You put those into a safe, you keep them protected. Same thing with asset protection on real estate investments or corporate shares. So anything of value you want to put behind the legal barriers and out of your personal name so that it's not easily attached with a lien or reached with creditors and judgments. Um, and then the main players of this is going to be you, the person being sued, the defendant, the person suing you, the plaintiff, um, the attorneys, the courts and the, and the court orders, and then judgment creditors. Okay. So you've listed a lot of the, of the different people that are involved from the defendant plaintiff courts um, and, and your legal representation, but even, so, so let's imagine, so you're talking a little bit about it, And I love that example that it's a safe, right? Because that just makes so much sense to everyone. When you have things that are valuable, yeah. you put them in a safe so that not just anyone can get to them. And it's a very similar concept for those uh, other tangible assets that, uh, that, that you have. And so, hey. sorry, go ahead. Do you want to oh, no, something? I said exactly. You just you own something, you own shares of it. It's in your name. We just want to get it out of your personal name and into something. It's called a business entity. LLC is like limited liability companies or limited partnerships, you know, and then layer it up. Depending on where you fall on the sliding scale of net worth, we just layer it up. Okay. And so so this brings another question. So who is a who typically is your client that is looking for your services? Like, and I'll just use myself as, as an example, mm -hmm. like I, like someone who is maybe first generation accredited investor, maybe didn't have people around them that talked about asset protection. Once you start meeting people, of course, but let's talk to that person that just, they don't even know really if the asset protection is something they should be thinking about. If it is like, where do they start beyond listening to you today, yeah. which is great, but just, just help us understand how do we, how do we get started on this path? Yeah. So first you need to realize like if you own something, there's liability that runs with it. So you need to look at not like, what's your day job? Are you a doctor who's also investing? You know, so you have liability from your profession, your day job, plus your investments, plus your car. Do you have kids that drive your car? Do you give your car to friends to drive? So we look at the whole spectrum and picture of where does all your liability come from? And then we also look at where's your assets at? Is it a lot of cash that's stuck in your safe? You know, okay, if you're carrying a million dollars of cash in your savings account, great, I'm glad you have a really big bankroll. You're probably not making any return on investment off of that just sitting there. So you need to figure out a way, like I would say, invest it because also what we're doing from an asset protection standpoint, cash is the easiest thing to get. So when I look at someone to sue them, I'm looking at where can I get a, a judgment you know, out of? Where can I get the money from. So if I have a million dollar judgment against you, where's the first place I'm going to look? Your bank accounts. So you don't want to keep a lot of cash on hand in your savings account. That should be broken up, spaced out, and then preferably into you know, some sort of cash flowing properties, which are then owned by an LLC, which then has a limited partnership owning that LLC, which is then wrapped safely around a nice asset protection trust. That's how you layer it out, but you don't want all your cash sitting in one little easy spot where I can go break into that safe and take it all. Mm. Um, that's just not good um, protection. Um, and so where you can go is you, is scalable. So if you're just starting out, you don't need to call to you know the Taj Mahal attorney. You can call to us. We work with high net worth accredited investors, a million net plus, but we also take in entry level clients who want to start investing, have the money to start investing, and then we scale them up as they go and grow and then reach out to the missing wheels and the missing people. We don't have a wealth manager. Okay, go to this. You know, We recommend this person. You don't have a good CPA. We recommend this person. You don't have good access to deals. Go here. You know, I'm not providing you those, but I, from nature of my business, I know the people you should be talking to. Um, and so if someone like you coming in, there may be a missing piece of the clog, I'll direct you there.
Um, your asset protection system will look at what do you have? How do you own it? What do you own? Um, how much equity do you have in that? Because at the end of the day, we're protecting equity. You know, like I, I, and that's a big misconception. You can have a million dollar property leveraged to the wazoo, you know, leverage really high, you know, all of it mortgaged. That is basically well protected because there's nothing there for me to get. And then right. the bank is in a higher priority anyway. So whoever's suing you is going to be in a second position below the bank. Now, if you have, you know, half of that is in equity and you have $500,000 in equity, well, now we got to start protecting that equity. So now we have to start doing things beyond just the mortgage protection and start looking for, um, for more means and more tools in the toolbox to protect what you have. Okay. So, it, and I want to, and I'm just going to keep using this, um, the, the health concept of the safe, right? And, and yeah. so I, I want to go back there because you're, you're helping us to understand who is the, the, the person. So not just the person that is already an accredited investor or yeah. the, the person that has a million in assets, but it could be someone who is actually moving uh, towards that direction. Someone who is an accredited right. investor. And, and, and so uh, just so, and I guess as of today, uh, that is someone who in the United States has a, uh, as a previous two years of 200,000, if they're fi- filing in individually or 300,000 as, as a couple and, or uh, over a million dollars, not including your home and, and assets. And there is a new accreditation that someone can go through as well. But this is the typical person person that is looking to engage uh, your services. You helped us to understand about the safe and so asset protection in general, but I think you were giving us an idea kind of of the different types of asset protection that someone may want to to consider. So maybe if you can help us uh, at the next level, what should we be looking at? Yeah. So like if you're just starting out, a great place to start is an LLC, you know, a limited liability company, you know, like you don't have to, like no matter what, like when you're just starting out, this is when the most lawsuits most likely are going to happen. You don't know what you're doing. Deals are going to right. fall apart. You know, you're perceived to be a big target to have money. So you're going to be sued there. You're going to be sued on deal issues. If mold comes up in that property and you're new, you're a greenhorn, you're a newbie, however you want to call it, you know, like this is when you're going to probably have um, the largest amount of loss right now. Then the next one is when you actually become really successful and you're doing really big deals. And then eventually those really big deals are going to fall apart. You have to have the big structures in place, like the asset protection trust and the bridge trust and the offshore components for it. But when a person comes in, the layers are, no matter what, an LLC. If you own a piece of real estate, you want that real estate to be put into an LLC. There's strengths and weaknesses to LLC. You know, there's, they're not a silver bullet. You know, I think most people say like, oh, I have a limited liability company. I'm good. No, you know, they don't hide the ball that they're limited. First word, first letter L limited. They tell you that point blank. So don't think that this is not going to be easily pierced. They're Mm -hmm. very easily pierced in the U S especially depending on what state, you know, you're at. Um, And then the next misconception is this big theory called anonymity. And so I hear this all the time, create an anonymous LLC, like a Wyoming anonymous LLC. You're going to disappear and a lawsuit's never going to find you. No one will ever know you exist. Break that, and, break that, break that down for it. So there's another word that you mentioned before. So some people may not be familiar with it. So you said that it may be, it may pers- uh, pierce the veil. So if you could t- t- talk about what that is and then talk about the anonymity uh, yeah. aspect. Yeah. Yeah, sure thing. So piercing the veil is just a simple term that we use in the law. That means we're going to go through the protection to limit your liability. And now we're going to hold you personally liable. And then not just the assets in the LLC, but you personally. Um, And this is very, very easy to do, especially for real estate um, investors, because most of the time you're setting up an LLC to just hold the, the asset, the property. That by nature is not a business. So now that is just an extension of you personally holding that asset. Um, So that would be my very first go-to argument of piercing that LLC veil and holding you personally liable is this is just an extension of a holding company of yourself. That will win like nine times out of 10. Then the next one is just very poor, which almost everybody does this accounting and commingling funds. People are very lazy eventually when money comes in, money comes out, transferring money from business accounts to personal accounts, personal accounts back to business accounts. You just commingled your separation of your business entity to your personal life. That's the second easiest way to pierce that veil and hold you personally accountable. And then there's other ways, but those are the number two like gold standards of why LLCs have this really like it's a fake facade. It's just smoke and smokes and mirrors. Um, they're good. You got to have something. You got to start somewhere. Um, 
but you can't simply rely on that because it's very easily pierced. And then you hear about the, the word anonymity. And so it's a very big misconception of LLCs. And, you know, it's basically, like I said, I'm just going to disappear for, and you're never going to find me even if I'm being sued. Mm-hmm. And so when your LLC is being sued, you're going to be legally required to appear and defend it. You can't just not defend it or, or a, a default judgment is going to be entered against that. Then also, you know, the complaint will simply be amended, you know, through the discovery process, your name's going to be added on that lawsuit. Eventually you're going to be subpoenaed and forced to show up into court. So once the lawsuit happens and discovery process in the U S starts anonymity is out the door. Mm -hmm. Anonymity is good from a business functioning standpoint to where I don't want to be harassed by someone trying to do business with me and being able to look me up in my personal name and my address and knowing where I'm at. That's where anonymity works. It stops as soon as your your company is being sued because somebody has to show up and be defended. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the big issue is for anonymity to actually work, you have to actually then lie under oath. And that's a one-way ticket ticket to jail. Yeah. Yeah. And so an example of this is that, you know, very shortly after a judgment is going to be entered against you, the debtor, like you, the person who owns it, Mm -hmm. the creditor, the person suing you, they have a legal right to demand information about the assets you own. Mm -hmm. And the courts enforce this very, very broadly and very strongly. So at this point in litigation, the only way to actually keep an asset anonymous or a secret is to lie about them and commit perjury. Again, you're going to jail. Right. And so that's a really big misconception of, I think, how people think I can just disappear. No one's ever going to find me from these anonymous LLCs. That's not how they work. Okay. So then if you say you want to have your uh, your your trust in uh, Wyoming or Nevada or Delaware or something like that, I guess all of that could happen. But the moment you get sued, then guess what? It people, doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and, the issue, and really, if you're investing, and especially investing in the U.S., you create your LLCs in the state where the assets are at. You can't transfer state laws here in the U.S. Like I, um, if you have an asset in California, you're going to be sued in California. That's where the lawsuit is. That's where the property is at. That's where the damage is coming through. Who cares if it's in a Wyoming or Delaware LLC? That's a different state. That state laws don't transfer to another state where you're being sued. Mm-hmm. So that's why we don't recommend creating an LLC in a state that the asset's not in. You're just paying double maintenance you know, fees on it to maintain something that's not going to work anyways. So what you do is you create the LLC in the state where it's at, create a second tier management company that's going to own that LLC. All the IRS K1s flow into that management company. So it cleans up that system. And then you create an asset protection trust, preferably a bridge trust, which is a combination of a um, Cook Islands asset protection trust. And then we bridge it back domestically to the U.S. for ease and compliance. For people in Europe, you know, or, you know, non-U.S. residents, we just don't build the bridge back to the U.S. Because if you you don't want to have that U.S. jurisdictional connection if you don't need it. So, so, so there's a couple of things. So, so not having that U.S. jurisdictional, jurisdictional connection um, can be a good thing, provided you understand it. So let's even take a, another step back. So you mentioned a couple of things. So an asset protection trust and a bridge trust. Are yeah. they the same thing? Are they different? How do they work together? And why? Wh- what, does this, what would this actually do for someone who's looking for asset protection? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'm just going to break it down to talking about jurisdiction, and then you'll understand why cool. in a little historical context. And then the whole picture will develop in front of, for your listeners. So this awesome. is the final layer of protection. So like, you know, you think about winter, you know, your first layer, merino wool on your skin, LLC. Mid-layer, that's going to be your limited partnership um, holding company. The final layer, your outer shell, you know, it's really cold. Um, layer is, a, is an asset protection trust. What jurisdiction means and why it's so important is that the laws then rules that govern you and trust and business entities, they're different. They're going to be different from one jurisdiction to another, which means one country from another, one state from another, even one county from another. And so you have two options, you know, when you can create an asset protection trust. It doesn't matter what country you're in. You can either create them here domestically in the U.S., you can create them in your own country, or you can create them in the Cook Islands. Um, I prefer the power, if you're in the U.S., of going offshore. Um, And the reason for this is they have what's called statutory non-recognition. And then for your foreign investors and your, you know, international listeners who are investing in the U.S., um, 
you can create, like I said, the Cook Island Foreign Asset Protection Trust. We just don't bridge it back domestically to the US because there's no point in having you connected to another jurisdiction and tying you into that if you don't need to be there. Um, but the Cook Islands is the strongest asset protection trust in the world globally over 40 years that anybody can have. Um, but for a little historical context to this, the offshore trust got created in 1984 in the famous Cook Islands, you know, and like I said, I prefer the Cook Islands because it's the best home court advantage. And the reason for it is what I said before, statutory non-recognition. Um, they don't recognize any other countries. Um, court orders or judgments. They're completely worthless in the Cook Islands. And so you'd have to start the case all over from scratch, facing the highest legal standard in the world, the murder standard. So if, just for a civil lawsuit, they have to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm. The plaintiff has to front all the court costs, flying a judge from New Zealand. You can't take your other country's lawyers there. They don't have commission-based attorneys. Um, they have to front the entire court cost. And if they lose, they pay which you can't, you don't have that here in the U S mm -hmm. and that's another big caveat right there. Cause if you got to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt, most likely you're going to lose. And there's only a one year statute of limitations, okay. but to be purely foreign, purely in the cook islands, it's expensive and it's a hard pill to swallow. There's a lot of IRS compliance that has to be done on top of that disclosures. Um, it's, it's, it's overkill for most investors. And so then what they end up doing is settling for a domestic US-based asset protection trust because um, they, they just don't want to deal with all the extra hoops that they have to jump through. Mm -hmm. The US domestic asset protection trust came 10 years later. Um, of all places, Alaska started them. And then you know, like once one state does it, you're going to have Delaware, Wyoming, Nevada, they're going to create them, obviously. Mm -hmm. So now in the US, we have about 20 states with domestic asset protection statutes. The problem with these purely US-based domestic asset protection trusts and why these ones fail is on effectiveness because we have the US constitution and we have the full faith and credit clause. And what this means is that you can't run from judgments from other states. So if you're getting sued in one state and you get a judgment in that state, you can't just say, oh, well, my company's created here in Delaware and now because I got sued in California, we're not gonna recognize it. Full faith and credit. You have to give every state's judgments and orders full faith and credit under the extension of the law. Um, and so what that's why I'm not a big fan of anything purely domestic that doesn't have an offshore component, because I want to have the big gun statutory non-recognition in my back pocket mm -hmm. to say, hey, I don't care if you have a million dollar judgment against me. The lawsuit didn't go away. I transferred my assets to the offshore component of my trust. We're not going to recognize that judgment. Even if you have a U.S. judgment, it's worthless. You have to be able to collect the assets and, and exercise that judgment in the Cook Islands, which you're not going to be able to. Go away or we'll give you a penny on the dollar. And that's how that works. Okay. And so so that's helping to give an example. So I'm, I'm just thinking to myself, all right, <clears throat> I'm, I'm listening to Billy and Brian and Brian's giving us this explanation. I live in, uh, I don't know, uh, let's say I live in California. Yeah. And I'm looking at investing in a, well, I've got a bunch of assets that I have. And I, I guess it would be great if you could help us walk through the process of, mm -hmm. I am a person, I have X million in assets. Um, I don't have any of it in the safe. Uh, some of it's in my name. Some of it's been in a in an LLC because I was told that I should do that yeah. um, because I invested passively and I've got a couple of apartments and I've got a couple of ATMs. I don't know. Yeah. Like, w What is the thought process that I should be going through when I'm engaging with like, and then I'm just going to say you, right? I'm engaging yeah. with you to make sure that I am keeping everything that I have as safe as possible mm -hmm. and so that I can maintain it. Like, what should my, what is the process for me to go through and figuring out what is the right thing for me um, offshore, domestic, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, we're making sure that the assets are held properly. And then we're making sure that the jurisdictions, we have different layers. And then we're making sure our final layer is as strong as possible. And so, you know, the first layer is your base layer. You know, you're going to have insurance and then you're going to have a single member disregarded LLC. And then these LLCs are going to be held, they're going to be owning your real estate, you know, and your other assets that can hurt somebody that need a key that you have to have insurance on, like a boat or a plane that can go boom. You put those into an LLC and you have insurance. Mm -hmm. um, the next layer is your multi member asset management. It's going to be a limited partnership. Mm -hmm. And this is going to act as your holding company. 
and it holds a bulk of all your assets. So it's going to hold and own those LLCs, as well as cash, stocks, bonds, passive syndication, shares, receivables, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, the final layer is your outer layer, which is the asset protection bridge trust. And it's going to be the minority limited partner of that mid layer, that limited partnership. Um, that's the non-controlling interest, you know, but it's the ownership interest. And so that's what you want is a separation of ownership from use and enjoyment. So you'll be the managing member of that limited partnership. The bridge trust or your asset protection trust is going to own that limited partnership. So you're managing your assets through the mid layer. And then you're also the beneficiary creator and settler of the protection trust. And then that asset protection trust has the benefit of offshore Cook Island statutory non-recognition. And then either you die and your assets gets get distributed by you know the directions of your living trust, mm -hmm. or there's a crisis like a lawsuit, and the bridge is you know the bridge trust is triggered, and the assets cross the bridge by dropping the IRS compliance codes that make them classified as domestic. So we drop those compliance, and then through the migration policy of the trust, you now have the power of statutory non recognition. And by having this power in your back pocket, it's very effective. And so you've created a three-tiered layer protection system, um, wrapping up each property individually in the state and the LLC, having those LLCs go into the management company. That cleans up your taxes because all those K-1s flow through that management company. So it's just one tax filing. Your bank account's connected for your business to that management company. You're managing all the assets because you're the managing member of that. You can add your spouse as another managing member to that. The bridge trust or asset protection trust owns that limited partnership. And then it's that limited partnership and the asset protection trust together that gives you that really good solid strength. So, so, I, so Brian, I love the way that you just broke that down for everyone, right? Because a lot of times when you don't have uh, the the access, right? Or you're just beginning to build your assets in a way that um, that you need to begin to start to think about how do you protect them? Yeah. These are some of the things that you don't normally hear about. So for those, and, and I, so you talked about the safe early on, and now I, yeah. I, I like this kind of new concept, which is really how do you put on your t-shirt, you put on the windbreaker, and then you put on the heavy jacket before you walk outside in the winter, right? Because you want to make sure that you are absolutely staying warm and protected uh, underneath. And so if you think about the different layers, where you think about your insurance, or you're thinking about your LLCs, it's kind of like that t-shirt level. And then you go into your LPs, where you're putting all of your different assets in that way. And then you look at the jurisdiction. It's a very nice way to to think about how you can start to, to, to put a plan together for protecting your assets. And I think more importantly, and when we listen to you, Brian, it's, this is where we come, always come together and we talk about teamwork makes the dream work. So having a member of your team that can, from an asset protection, think about these things, ask you the questions that Brian, that you're talking to us about now, but you're also even taking into consideration you're not advising on the different aspects of, of holding the, the, the assets or maybe tax implications, but this is an area where you can say, you need to make sure that you're talking to this member of the team to take into consideration uh, tax, or you need to take to another member that takes into consideration something else. So great example, and just another reason to make sure that you have someone that is proficient on your team that can help you in all of the different areas, specifically today uh, in asset protection. So uh, a really, really awesome example. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. So, so Brian, I guess, um, is there anything else that we kind of haven't talked about that you think is really important in terms of a concept from asset protection? Yeah. You know, there, I mean, I could talk about this for yeah. days, but <laughs> I think that the, like the other biggest misconception is just like where insurance plays in all of this. Okay. You know, so I'm like, I have insurance and I have an umbrella policy. I'm good. I don't need anything. Um, and you know, this is definitely a hot topic and insurance is great. It's a great place to start, you know, but it's not the end and it has a lot of shortcomings. And I see a lot of clients having a false sense of security thinking like, Oh, Hey, I'm being sued. And you know, they're going to solely rely on their insurance to cover them. You know, this just isn't the case, but I do recommend every single person get insurance, you know, as much as they can afford, but they also need to read the insurance policy and read the fine print. You know, like we're talking off, you know, camera, like I, you know, do a lot of presentations at investment summits and I'll be talking in front of like a thousand people. 
Raise your hand. How many people have read the insurance policy in your fine print? I don't think more than one or two people would even raise their hand. How many people know what their claim limit is or even what that word claim limit even means? Um, nobody would even know. And so a good place to start is to actually just first understand that, you know, real estate law, especially in the U.S., is the most heavily litigated area of law there is. Um, and so it's not a matter of when, but, you know, you know, you know, if but when you're going to be sued and in what condition you're in to actually defend yourself. And when it comes to insurance, just keep in mind that insurance companies don't cover you for fraud, punitive damages, or intentional wrongdoings. You know, they don't pay claims for what's called direct results of unlawful acts. Mm. And what your listeners need to understand is just the basic concept of insurance defense. There's a whole reason there's an industry called insurance defense. You know, like they're just not going to freely give you money, especially like insurance is good for small things, but not big things. And, you know, what this is like when from the moment you're being sued, the very first statement or communication or an email or a text message you made with a buyer or a seller or anybody in a deal process, um, those lawsuits are going to be based on allegations of fraud. And the courts are going to look at those statements that you made, like an email saying the plumbing was done or something like that. And the courts are going to say, well, that's a statement. Statements are intentional. And then your insurance company is going to say, oh, this is now an intentional act. And now this is going to be, um, we're not going to cover you because this is there's potential lines of fraudulent um, or wrongdoings here. Mm-hmm. That's their out. And if you think we're wrong, go ahead and sue us. We're just not going to cover you. So then you have a double-edged lawsuit. You're being sued. You have to sue, sue your insurance provider. And it's the insurance provider job in a lawsuit to create legal separation from you. That's what they have to do. And it's the right thing to do from a business standpoint. Mm -hmm. So people need to understand, have insurance, understand the limitations of it. Wow. So that is yeah, definitely one of the things to keep in mind and understanding having the insurance, making sure that you understand um, what, 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 what is there that you've read the fine print and also what your role is beyond uh, just your specific policies and be prepared that, uh, well, you know, what's there, you're going to, someone's going to be there to defend the interest of the, uh, of your insurance carrier. So, Wow, man, this has been this has been really, really awesome, Brian. And I know that there's so many more things that we could that we could talk about that we could uh, that we could go into. Um, it's also one of these things where I always say, you know what, everybody's got the same amount of time, and unfortunately, we can't just yeah. keep talking forever and ever. So, um, look, before I get to the well, no, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and ask you the final. Uh, the going long final three. But the thing is, Brian, I never ask the questions unless you tell me that you're ready for me to ask you the going long final three. So, are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. All right, man. I'm, you're born ready, man. Here we go. Um, so, so listen, we started on the other side of the pond and I'd like to bring it back towards Europe. So help us understand what is your favorite European city, either that you visited or still on your bucket list? I want to say the next one. Like I've traveled the world. So, I mean, I've been to so many. Um, I haven't been to um, Prague yet. So I really want to go to Prague. Wow. Really? Okay. Yeah. It's a great city. Great city. Yeah. Okay. Prague is cool. Um, I spent a month in Prague in January. Okay. If I can recommend anything, go in the summertime. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Unless you really like the cold. Um, so, okay, Prague. So we will another vote for Prague. Uh, listen, Brian, there's also two successful people have tended to make only one mistake in their life. Okay. I'm just kidding a little no. bit. So many, many, many mistakes. Yeah. Right. And so, but if you can think about what is one mistake that, um, that you've seen that's happened that if, if you could think about a lesson from that mistake, that it would really be helpful, uh, for someone else to not make the exact same mistake. Yeah. You need to check your ego, you know, like sometimes less is more in the long run. So if mm. you're playing a short game, you know, you can be piggish, but if your game is to be really, really successful, Surround yourself with success. And sometimes to surround yourself with success, that's the payment. And then how's that going to set you up and propel you for the future? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I had to go through that learning experience a lot. And um, when I took less and learned more, I then ramped up my business and my personal life faster. Got you. Less is more. Love that. Check the ego. Um, awesome. Awesome, man. And so listen, so the last thing really would love to know, uh, what book would you recommend to the, uh, to the going long audience? Yeah, I know everyone's like, Oh, so money. So I'm, I'm going to stay off of the money, you know, books and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm going to go with the alchemist, the alchemist. Yeah. yeah. And so it's a great book. It relates to also money, but not, and it, it's a personal growth book It's probably like the second highest selling book or third highest selling book in the world beyond the Bible. Wow, okay. Very, very quick read. An amazing story of a shepherd finding his way. 
Okay. Fantastic. So the alchemist will make sure they include that as well in the show notes. Um, you know, Brian, this has been really awesome. So giving us an opportunity to learn more about asset protection uh, from an expert uh, as yourself and really making it in a way that is simple to understand the concepts. And of course, you know, when, when we think about what what you've talked to us about today, so really even at the very beginning, helping us to understand the difference between a revocable trust yeah. and an irrevocable trust and the difference between one that doesn't have any asset protection and the other one that actually does. From there, you've helped to break it down um, and really thinking about that that asset protection is really being the safe that protects our uh, our different assets. I love the, the the different layers and thinking about the different layers and how they play in with one another. And you've given us some key concepts to think about, you know, th- thinking about the bridge trust or the asset protection trust. And then also giving us the concepts like the domestic trust a- as well as a uh, foreign offshore. So, um, Wow. It's been a lot. Wow. And, and there's so much more that we can talk about. And I know that there are a lot of people that are like, you know, what? I know I need to find out more from Brian Bradley. Like this dude definitely has it going on. I'm in this point in my life now where I really need to start uh, thinking about protecting my assets. And Brian is the guy that I need to talk to. So what is the best way for the going long audience to connect with you and your team so that they can find out about how to protect their assets as quickly as possible? Yeah, they can just email me, Brian, B-R-I-A-N at btblegal.com. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn just as a platform. So I'm on LinkedIn a lot. Um, they can just jump on my website, www.btblegal.com. I have tons of information on my website and frequently asked questions section, videos, media stuff, brochures. Because I just like it. It's an education. And this is a confusing topic. You got to educate yourself. Um I do free consultations because I'm I don't like people being afraid to talk to you know an expert because of consultation fees and shopping around and just and so it's like just pick up the phone, let's go over what you got. I may be more expensive than you're ready for, or you just want to talk to other people, but you need the education. Love that. Love that. So everything from Brian B R I-A-N at btblegal.com. You can go to btblegal.com and check him out on his website as well. And also the consultation. And I think that's amazing, right? That you, that people can actually reach out to you and feel comfortable that you're going to help to educate them. Uh, and the website is pretty awesome. Got lots of, uh, lots of uh, resources there. So I would definitely say go over and check out all of the different resources that Brian mentioned. And, um, you know, Brian, for, for me, I would just like to personally thank you for investing your time with me and the entire Going Long audience. It's been very educational, and I'm sure that uh, a number of us will be reaching out to you so that you can help to continue uh, educate us and, and, and help us to be on the right path in terms of uh, asset protection. So thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me. All right. Awesome. So listen, uh, also too, to the going long audience, uh, listen, Brian has invested some time with this, really helped you understand the concept of, uh, of asset protection. I know the examples that he've given has given us have helped to solidify this concept and even at, started to get you to ask some questions. So, you know, if you have those questions, I'm sure that you have at least two or three other friends that have those kinds of questions and you can really help them. So why don't you go out and share today's episode with at least two or three other people. Um, you will be helping them lots. Uh, and also take the time to leave us a review. Um, both Brian and I would love to know what it is that you liked about what uh, Brian was talking about today, how it resonated with you. And if there's some other things that you would like for Brian to talk about, it's it's a great place. So leave us the review. If you want to leave it a five-star review, we'll accept that as well. So feel free to do that. And, um, you know, I want to just say, I'm really looking forward to welcoming you back to the next episode. Uh, And until then, I want you to go out and make it a great day. Thank you very much. Wow. Don't you love hearing from top-notch experts in the field? You know, when I was getting started, I really wish that I would have had access to such experts. And even more, I wish they would have given me like a really simple list of things to follow so that I could have gotten to my goals much faster and been much happier even sooner. So that's why I've created for you the seven things that you should avoid in order to be successful in long distance investing. And you can pick that up really easily by going to billykeels.com forward slash seven things to avoid. And also, if you liked today's episode, don't forget to leave a five-star review. I'm looking forward to seeing you on our very next episode. So go out and make it a great day.